is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That is the FanDuel Podcast Network sports betting podcast. As we're taking a look ahead to week number four of college football and breaking down the best bets on the board with Kelly Stewart. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Fang of ThePowerRank.com. Ed, we are on to week four of college football. Week three of NFL is up next. Football season is kind of flying by, so how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I'm looking forward to a great uh, week four in college football. A lot of big-time games against uh, national title contending type teams, and uh, looking forward to talking to Kelly Stewart about it. And we haven't had a lot of like big, high-end games yet in college football. We, like We had you know, it's, Auburn, Oregon, but outside of that, yeah. it's been kind of you know barren, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we had LSU, Texas, too, which was a great mm. game. Um, but yeah, last week wasn't the best, you know, we, we had Iowa, Iowa state, which was fun. Uh, and fun is a one word <laughs> well, for it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was a close game. I was, uh, we're going to go through that and covering this, covering the past. Uh, I was all prepared for this game. I had my afternoon set and then it was not played in the <laughs> afternoon. Uh, so I'm mad at the weather more than anything. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but we talked, we're, we're going to be talking to Kelly Stewart. Uh, you can find her on Twitter at Kelly in Vegas. And she's doing a whole lot of stuff uh, for this fall. She's an analyst for Bleacher Report's betting show, which you can find uh, live on NFL Sundays. You can also find her on Wager Talk TV, talking both the NFL and college football. She has a new podcast called The Kelly and Murray Show. All that stuff and the podcast you can find wherever you get your podcasts as well. She does a lot of stuff, uh, whether it be NFL or college football. We're going to go through week four of college football with Kelly, talk about her general betting process, where she thinks her strengths lie in betting. We're going to preview Michigan versus Wisconsin, which I'm excited for. We have Auburn versus Texas A&M, and then Notre Dame at Georgia. Some pretty heavy number fire interests in that game on both sides. I've got a lot of Notre Dame fans and one big Georgia fan over at number fire. So I think they will be very interested in that game as well. So a pretty big week of college football. We're going to have the NFL show coming up tomorrow, talking with Brett Colson to preview NFL week number three to get that podcast and everyone that we do. Make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcasts, you can subscribe. And also make sure while you are there, you leave a rating and review. But before we get to Kelly, we got to go through last week's college football show, and I have to eat crow about Iowa State. Covering the past. All right, so Ed, last week on the college football show, we were talking about Iowa versus Iowa State, and your numbers liked Iowa State, and you were talking about the spread, and I thought that was great. I loved that. I got a little greedy, and I was like, hey, let's take the Iowa State money line, and they covered the spread, so point to Ed, they did not get the money line in not the most frustrating fashion, yeah, but bad. it was up there. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, there, there is nothing wrong with taking the money line on this because um, it was a very lopsided game by the underlying numbers. Uh, I'm looking at it here. Iowa State at 7.7 yards per play uh, compared to 4.4 uh, for Iowa. I mean, that is very lopsided. Yeah. Um, obviously, some turnovers uh, played a big role in this game. Uh, right down to the end, you know, Iowa's punting toward to Iowa State. And, um, you know, the knucklehead Iowa State special teams player runs into his own receiver and, uh, you know, they muff the punt and the game is essentially over. So many, many ways Iowa State could have won that game. There should be zero regret on your part for for taking the money line. Um, But, you know, I mean, the you know, we talked a little bit about the timing of the game. I actually enjoyed it because I got to see more of it because it ended up going later in the day. Got to see the end of it. And, you know, I was pretty pumped that. The, the side was never in question kind of right. late in that game. Um, but obviously I wanted to see Iowa State win this game because, you know, they're definitely a team that uh, I'm very high on. I'm very yeah. high on going into the Big 12. Um, and, yeah, they couldn't get it done, which is disappointing for them. But, you know, Purdy's been excellent this year yeah. in, in the two well, games that they played. That's what you want to see. Uh, you know, the defense is probably pretty good, although I, I still don't know exactly what I think of Nate Stanley and yeah. the Iowa offense. So, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think 
I think we were both right on the money there, and yeah, you know, it's really bad luck to. to Regret not is not the money. word I would use. I would say frustrated. Uh, yeah. mo- it would be would be more so the word frustrated because of the timing. Because I live in Syracuse, so we had people uh, over to watch the Syracuse Clemson game. So I didn't get to see the end of the yeah. Iowa Iowa State game until later, and I saw right. the manner in which they lost because I saw the score and I was like, oh, it's frustrating. And then I saw the manner in which they lost, and it there's always been this joke on Big Ten Twitter about how Kirk Ferentz loves to punt to win. And somehow <laughs> he punted to win. And it was a combination of everything. To just like, it was so frustrating. Uh, but I think that, you know, Iowa State, both in that game against Northern Iowa and the game against Iowa, had the better underlying metrics, as you mentioned, and yeah. could make them a team that we value going forward because perception could be slanted. You go to overtime against an FCS team, you lose to at home to a, a big rival. Those are things that could weigh things down. So, yeah, but I, I mean, moving I hope, forward, yeah. moving forward, you just have to love that Brock Purdy threw for nine yards an attempt against a pretty good. I mean, I think is a pretty good Iowa defense. And he's a sophomore, man. Like we talked about him on the, the Heisman so. show with yeah. Edward Egros, and. Yeah. He's really good. It didn't bo- yeah. it hasn't seemed at least so far to bother him to not have Hakeem Butler and David Montgomery. So I like Brock Purdy as an NFL prospect eventually, but as a quarterback that we can bet on, I still like him despite uh, the result there. Other things we went through last week when Ed and I were by ourselves, we talked to OU and UCLA. Ed, you said you <laughs> wanted no part of UCLA. You no. pro- they proved you right. Uh, oh so, my gosh. Like, have <laughs> we- they, like, our expectations of them have shifted gra- drastically since the start of the year. But, like, I, mean, I feel like they validate that at every turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm wondering if this is the team that my numbers Quits. will just never catch up to this year. Um, Are they like the, the 2019 Louisville, basically? Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, it, you know, that team could also be Michigan or Stanford, too. But True. let's not. Let's not talk about that quite yet because I have a little bit more confidence in what those programs have done over the long term under the current coach. Um, You know, I talked to someone who follows UCLA pretty closely this week and who's better. And, and, you know, he he wasn't quite ready to throw in the towel yet. Sure. Um, But, I mean, you did see the domination of Oklahoma and that offense. Yeah, it was one of these games where my eight year old was like, yeah, let's let's turn on that Oklahoma game. They they can score. Yeah, right. <laughs> or they did um, at will. And, you know, I mean, you know, we know Chip Kelly is kind of an offensive guru. and But really, the defense, they had so many guys coming back on that side of the ball. Right. And, I mean, they've just been terrible. Yeah. And not just against a high-powered offense in Oklahoma. So UCLA is a, I would say, a flagged team. I don't know if that's a term, uh, but that's, like a that's flagged. A good, I like it. It's flagged. Yeah. They are flagged. They are flagged in my mind. And, and an interesting yeah. spot with – uh, a Washington State program that I'm very in- intrigued in where their general tra- trajectory is going this week. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, we also talked Ohio State versus Indiana, and we were talking that game, and I was like, the only play I, I really see here was uh, the-, the over. It was 61 points, uh, and it was 51 to 10 at the end of the third <laughs> quarter. No more points were scored, so push, yeah. which is fun. Um, but Ohio State... That defensive line, I think, really showing that it can do whatever it wants to at this point, which is uh, really fun. And that offense is still here to stay. So Ohio State, a really impressive team so far. Alabama against South Carolina. We didn't have a play here, but uh, South Carolina didn't cover. Uh, They were uh, (laughs) 26-point underdogs. Hey, a cover is a cover. Good teams win. Great teams cover. South Carolina was great on Saturday. So I think that's... uh, all we can say there. So overall, Ed, uh, good week for you last week with being frightened of UCLA and wanting to stay as far away from them as possible and uh, wanting Iowa State. I'm very frustrated, I think, is what I'll do. So we're going to talk to Kelly here in just one second to get her thoughts on week four. But if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. We're going to bring in Kelly Stewart to break down week four of college football. You can find her on Twitter at Kelly in Vegas. Once again, she's an analyst for Bleacher Report's betting show, which is live on NFL Sundays. She also has Wager Talk TV and has a new podcast called The Kelly and Murray Show. Let's bring in Kelly Stewart to break down week four of college football. 
covering the present. Let's welcome Kelly Stewart into covering the spread. Kelly, I know you have a crazy busy schedule this time of year. You've got uh, the show going on over at Bleacher Report. You're on Wager Talk TV. So a lot of stuff going on. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Wednesday is my busy day. So excited to get the day started and uh, talk some college football. Absolutely, awesome. and it is a pretty fun weekend on tap for college football. we got some big games. We'll break that down those in just one second. First, Kelly, I kind of want to dive in to your individual betting process and things you've noticed so far across the first three weeks of college football because we've seen a lot of stuff happen. Have there been any big takeaways for you from those first three weeks, uh, whether it be individual teams you may be higher on now or more macro things you may have noticed in those weeks? Yeah, from a macro perspective, the SEC has three good teams, a bunch of the middle of the road at best. The Big 12 is really interesting this year. Um, man, K-State really surprised me last week against Mississippi State. The Pac-12, though, just what we expected. It seems like Utah and everyone else just is in the ACC. I don't think anybody's going to upset Clemson. I'd love to see LSU give Alabama a run for their money. But my biggest surprise team that I was higher on to start the year, uh, we'll talk with Ed here a little bit about power ratings. I do not do my own. I actually do use his as well, okay. was BYU. And then they really just faltered. They threw those two pick sixes against Utah. And I said, okay, I'm going to come back around. And here I am for the third week in a row looking to back the Cougars. So uh, they are kind of my surprise team this year. Interesting. Excellent. And uh, you mentioned K State, and you know you know a thing or two about K State. Uh, <laughs> so let's hear your your you know your insider insights. Good game last week. Obviously, the the helicopter spin move by Mississippi State was pretty fun. Uh, but what have been your thoughts on uh, K State so far this year? You know, K State when they played Nichols, and then they played bowling green and shut them out in Manhattan. I said this is what K State does. They beat up on these little cupcake schools. Um, Bowling Green, I kind of thought would put up a better fight. I didn't think they'd be shut out. Sure enough, K-State looked good. Now, I gobbled up the nine Sunday afternoon when the line came out against Mississippi State because I knew it wouldn't be there. And at seven, I definitely considered some buyback. This is a K-State team that, for lack of better words, I kind of have a PTSD with from Bill (laughs) Snyder, okay? (laughs) Bill Snyder, great as an underdog, not so great laying points. He was a very um, great coach. I never would say anything bad about the guy, but he was vanilla, for lack of better words. He didn't keep his foot on the gas. And sometimes I didn't feel like he played to win the game. I think he played to burn out the clock and hopefully win the game. And so now with Chris Kleiman and company in Manhattan, life looks really good. I'm I'm very surprised to see how much they are letting Skylar Thompson throw the ball downfield and be able to make some of those bigger time plays where historically we haven't seen from K-State since the mid-90s. So really exciting things going on there. I I did bet the over five and a half season win total. Mainly that was for my dad. And then I piggybacked (laughs) on top of it because, of course, if it was to win, I'd be mad I didn't have a little bit extra on myself. But, you know, he called me to cash that bet out already. And I said, Dad, (laughs) what the breaks? Oklahoma State's going to give us a run for their money. Texas, Texas Tech is going to be there. Uh, Baylor is still kind of an unknown to me. Baylor looks good, but who have they played? I think they'll be tested here over the next couple weeks. So I'm excited to see what K-State's future looks like. Excellent. So, Kelly, when it comes to betting on college football, what do you view to be your strengths, and and how do you take advantage of that in, in looking for games? So as I mentioned, um, I use several people's power ratings. I use Ed's. Uh, Kenny White has always been a mentor of mine from the Don Best days back in 2013. He's always very helpful with those because for me, I don't have the time with all the media constraints and doing other things to sit down and be able to build my own power ratings. I know that they take a significant amount of time. So I know that the bottom line is the math is the math. When you break that part down, what I really like to focus on focus on a situational betting, look ahead spots, sandwich games, especially overreaction in the marketplace, uh, either due to perceived perception of a team, maybe an injury, and of course, how coaches do against the betting line. Last year, Pat Fitzgerald was an absolute moneymaker for (laughs) me, and I rode that the entire year. This year, BYU's starting to get it done, and, and maybe they keep it up, and looking for a couple other teams that, you know, are willing, and coaches willing to cover those those large numbers. We saw Jumbo Fisher, pretty much meaningless touchdown against Clemson, but he wanted to make sure he closed it within that number. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And so you kind of try to identify teams then for the most part that, that you think are undervalued by the markets and then ride those essentially? 
Yeah, absolutely. Listen, there are every single week, and especially early on in the season, we do see that the bookmakers put out these lines. Last week was West Virginia. It was one of my biggest plays because who is Maryland? Uh, I'm sorry, who is an NC State to be laying seven and a half on the road? And in sure. my opinion, I'm going, listen, this line is just a little bit too high. West Virginia, a little sprinkle on the money line. Again, Maryland. Maryland was putting up monster numbers. And here's just little old Temple. Nobody's paying attention to catching almost a touchdown at home. We saw that line plummet. And I had to jump on quick before I missed it. They also were in my money line parlay. And, you know, there's an Air Force team going into Colorado. That's the, Those are the kind of things where I'm looking going, okay, who got lucky last week to win or cover? Who's maybe, uh, we call them fat and sassy over at Wager Talk. And USC fit USC fit that bill. New quarterback comes in and they smoke Stanford in the second half of that game. All they got to do is beat BYU, but the line sitting at three and a half, four, had to make you wonder. Those are the type of things I'm looking for each and every week. I like, uh, for lack of better words, I'm greedy. I like that plus <laughs> money. I want those underdogs yeah. that are going to take it to the wire. They are not going to win all the time, but as long as they're in the mix and have a chance to get that plus 240, plus 350, plus even 190, I'm happy to be sitting in that position. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And especially with Maryland, I, I like to remind people that Mike Loxley is still their coach, no matter how well <laughs> they did in, in, in their first two games, and, and definitely something uh, I'm keeping an eye on. So, Kelly, you talked a lot about, you know, kind of evaluating teams and early season performance that, you know, might not be consistent with what we thought preseason. Uh, big one with Michigan at Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a three and a half point favorite. I think it opened up at two and a half and and has moved past that number of three, uh, total of 43. Wisconsin has destroyed some teams. Michigan has struggled. What's your take on this game? So let's actually go all the way back to May where the Golden Nugget here in Las Vegas put out their college football games of the year. Michigan minus five. Yep. Now, <laughs> initially, I did learn lean towards Wisconsin here. The home tr team trend between these two has won nine of the last 10 of the series. And with the short number, I'm like, okay, I basically just need Wisconsin to win. You have Jonathan Taylor. Looks like he's going to be in Heisman form. Patterson's numbers for Michigan down a little bit from last year. Ultimately, I think what we're seeing here is the public perception built into this line. Michigan fortunate, to, fortunate enough to get out of that game against Army. Now they're facing another heavy run team in Wisconsin. But who has Wisconsin faced? Right. Sure, their defense looks great, but they haven't really played anybody. Um, I would love to bet Michigan here, but Harbaugh 0-6 against the spread as an underdog. Woof. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't back Harbaugh here. And and honestly, I do think that we've seen some overreaction in this betting line. You'd be surprised how many of those college football games of the year really come down to those earlier numbers versus what the true line is when the game is played. Um, this one is going to be a good game, and I may get to Michigan before the weekend, but right now, I, I just haven't sold myself enough. And three and a half is a pretty tight spread, too. Think, so I think it makes sense if you're not sold one way or another to kind of stay away. Let's talk about Michigan broadly, though, because it, it can apply to them beyond this one, too, because I think you look at those first two games, Army is such a unique opponent that I think you could potentially write off uh, when a team struggles in that situation, did that game specifically worry you with Michigan? Or do you think that we're just kind of overreacting to that one game? No, I think we're definitely overreacting to an extent. Listen, this is the same Army team versus Oklahoma in overtime. I mean, this Army team, as you mentioned, has done this at other Power 5 schools before. This is not something that surprised me. Um, was I surprised on how conservative Har Harbaugh seemed to be in that game? Yes. Did I question some of his, some of the play calling? Of course. Does it concern me about Michigan as a whole? And the reason why I'm saying no is because I wasn't as high on Michigan as others were to start the year. I will say this. Wisconsin was a team I was quite a bit lower on. Mm -hmm. I did play them week one versus U USF and was shocked at the final score. <laughs> I was a little late to the party and thought, man, I'm going to get burned. This is going to land on 17. Sure enough, never in doubt. Uh, but I, I think that if I look back more towards my original uh, numbers, this should be closer to a pick em game. And so, again, it's not really to remind yourself what happened last. It's more right. to remind yourself we're betting numbers here. We're not betting teams. And yeah. on paper – Initially, Wisconsin appears to be the better team, and I think it's kind of fraudulent.
how far would the line have to move for you to feel good about Michigan? Like, are we talking like five, like Wisconsin minus five? Would that tempt you or if, would that move quite a bit? I think if we saw four and a half, I would take okay. the four and a half here with, with Michigan. Um, as I mentioned, Harbaugh, not good as an underdog. And I, mm-hmm. I kind of don't necessarily think that's a fault to him. I think anytime Michigan catching points is going to attract the public obviously. And so bookmakers sometimes, whether people want to admit it or not, I think like to trap people yeah. into some of those games. And, and that's why I think Har- Harbaugh's underdog uh, ATS record is not as good as maybe it should be. All right, let's move on yeah. here to Auburn at Texas A&M. Texas A&M, three and a half point favorite here. And the total is 48. And Bo Nix, a bit of a mixed bag, to say the least, so far for Auburn. He's had his, his bright points, obviously, but also a lot of lows. When you've watched Bo Nix and what you've seen from him through these first three games, what has been your overall impression of him as it pertains to this game against Texas A&M? So uh, we touched on all the different things that I'm doing this year. And at Bleacher Report, I sit at the Caesars Palace Sportsbook, and I have this giant screen in front of me, and my head is on a swivel. (laughs) Especially when I have six morning games going. It's not like at home where I've got my iPad, I've got my screen and screen, I'm flipping back and forth. So I'm going to be just blatantly honest with you guys. I have not watched one Auburn game. Not one. Uh, I did catch, obviously, the ballsy throw on the highlights against Oregon. And while that did get them the W, I kind of question either his or Gus Malzahn's decision-making there. He's completing 75% of his throws. So you have to give him a little leg up here. This is tough for me. These are two really... um, What's a good, better than mediocre SEC teams, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think they're up there with LSU. I don't think they're up there with Alabama, but they're right there along with Florida, right? You get, sometimes you get their best performance and other times you don't. You have really kind of a revenge game here, for lack of better words. And I, I think this is going to be a really good game. But as far as Bo Nix goes, I think you're right. He's a mixed bag. I think he's a question mark. And I need, to actually sit back and watch this game. But if I don't have any action on it, it's probably not going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does feel like Texas A&M has a little bit of the quarterback advantage here with Kellen Mond, a guy who I didn't really think could throw the football two years ago, uh, really bounced back last year under Jimbo Fisher. Um, They do have the edge. um, So I think that's an interesting, you know, I mean, the quarterback position obviously is going to play a role, and that's what we're seeing in the markets. We have this one, uh, Texas A&M minus three and a half right now. A&M did get the backdoor cover against Clemson. Now they're back home here, Kelly. So uh, do you think that they have enough juice here to cover against Auburn? Do you have a leaning uh, a certain way on this game or uh, just too close of a, of a contest for you right now? So it is interesting here. Now covering as a double-digit underdog on the road in a must-prove-yourself type of situation is much different yeah. Then laying numbers at home. Listen, as a Big 12 girl, as a, everybody probably already forgot, but a and was in the Big 12, College Station is a tough place to play. It is really rough, especially for a true freshman in Bo Nix. Um, no Deshaun Corbin for a and is something that I have to consider as well. These are both really good defenses. If you guys are going to make me pick, I'm going to lay the points here with a and um, Like I said, I, I haven't got there yet, and I do yeah. think Bo Nix is going to be a great quarterback. But again, I just I question his decision-making skills, and against the Aggies defense, he may falter once or twice, thus giving the Aggies a cover. But again, I'm not rushing to the window to bet this one. Right, and we would never make you pick a side. You know, it's more so just like talk through the games. Like if there's value to, to listeners in hearing, I don't have enough confidence in this game, or I think this is an efficient number. It sounds like that's where you're leaning with this one. Is there a number you would like for Texas A&M uh, to where you actually would be intrigued? Or is it just a game that's a total stay away for you? I'm looking at this, and I made Texas say not. Now, by saying I made, that means I use some other guys' power ratings right. that I've now adjusted throughout the course of the season. I always yep. want to be clear on that. Uh, I have Texas a and minus two and a half here. Okay. Uh, I think at two and a half, I would play a and I don't think it gets there. I think we're going to see Texas a and money coming in in this spot. And uh, come Saturday, we may see some buyback from the public on Auburn. But I think this is going to be kind of one of those sharp squares type of game um, that, to me, I wouldn't be surprised if this game ended, you know, 
34, 31, one of those type of things. And then I, and then I lose. So right. for me, it's, 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 uh, it's better left untouched, but again, I, I need to watch. That's right. the bad part. I haven't, I haven't watched a lot of sec this year because I haven't been involved in a lot of their games. Right. And right. that's uh, right. this time of year, it'll certainly amp up. So let's talk about another SEC team here uh, with Notre Dame going to Georgia. Georgia is a 14 point favorite here. Total is at 58 and a half right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I want to talk to you broadly about Notre Dame because the last time we saw them play a true title contender, they got waxed. It was 30 to three by Clemson in the playoff last year. But it's also important to remember that it's a totally different group of players and what they have this year, at least for the most part. So I want to talk to you broadly. When you see a team like Notre Dame have that type of a bad performance, does it stick with you in future years when they play tough opponents? Or do you write it off as being different group of kids, uh, different, different game? Does that stick with you when you see teams like Notre Dame kind of fall short in a big game like that? So I always tell people as sports bettors, we need to have short-term memories. If you try to remember what happened too much of last year or the year before, um, you can get really caught up. You know, I mm-hmm. joked about K-State and my reluctance to lay points or how they'd fared against the SEC, and they won the game outright. So I am going to take that out of the equation because I have been to several Notre Dame games, most notably the Miami game a couple of Novembers ago where they just got absolutely smashed in the mouth. Because that is, unfortunately, how they fare against most Power 5 schools. This Notre Dame team is different. Um, I do think that we're going to see Notre Dame put up a good fight. And this makes it hard for me because I have yet to see Ian Book do anything spectacular against teams not named Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. Right? And you have Kirby Smart. Um... And his Georgia Bulldog team that I think really hasn't been tested. I mean, really, Vandy's the best opponent they've faced. So here's a a Georgia team where laying 13 and a half makes me a little reluctant here. And um, I actually had a a stat. My buddy Ralph Michaels over at Wager Talk is so awesome because he puts up all these different things. Uh, When both teams are in the top 10 and one is favored by 12 and a half or more, the favorite is 13 and two against the spread. Wow. Initially, really? I was I was trying to make a case here for the Irish. I, I can't do it. You know, I, I wanted I want to like the Irish in the situation. I want to take the double digits in what I think should be a really great game. But again, until either one of these teams can prove me otherwise, I'm not I'm not getting involved. Interesting. Right. Yeah. And is Any, that more? Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, the total's at 58 and a half. Uh, do, you, do you like to bet totals, or do you have any opinions on this game? Uh, we talk mostly about sides in the show, so I was just wondering. Yeah, and sides, sides are my bread and butter. Every once in a while, yeah. you'll see me play a total. Um, and, and most of the time, that total's in NFL. It's not even in college. Right. College totals are, are always interesting. I did take a Texas Tech, Arizona under the other night, woke up. About 3 a.m. to check the score. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't even have to sweat that one. So every once in a while you get lucky. This this is – I'm looking at this game going, is this going to be 35-21? Is, is Notre Dame going to come to play? And we get over that total because they score a late garbage touchdown and they get the cover. I do think those two things are correlated. I do think that if Notre Dame is going to cover this game, it's going to go over the total. So we were talking right. before about Notre Dame and Georgia and how – you couldn't talk yourself into Notre Dame. Is that a confidence in Georgia or is it a lack of confidence in Notre Dame? Uh, having you being unable to talk yourself into Notre Dame here. You know, it's a lack of confidence um, on both teams. As I mentioned, I, I am not still sold that Ian book and his six touchdown passes are by any means the real deal. I know he's made no errors so far this year, but this Kirby smart team always intrigues me. As I mentioned, they haven't really been tested, yet here we are. We're pretty confident they're going to win the SEC East. We're pretty confident they're going to play uh, Alabama in the SEC championship game yet again, maybe get in the college football playoff. And I've seen glimpses of that. Um, I like like Jake Fromm, and I'm sure that there's going to be some remembrance of that game in South Bend in 2017 when Jake Fromm first started. I just, I try not to buy in too much of that. 
And and you're right. I think my lack of confidence is more my lack of confidence in Notre Dame. Sure. The only time I've even bet against them this year and watched them play was against Louisville. I knew that was entirely too many points for them on the road um, because they just I, I'm not sold on Brian Kelly is yeah. what I should say. As a coach, I, we talked about coaches that care about covering and coaches that that definitely attempt um, to put up numbers in order to cover games, and he's just not one of them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Really uh, so before we let you go here, Kelly, uh, do you have any other bets on the board that you like for week four? can be non-power five. It could be a team that you have latched on to, like you mentioned, you know, buying into teams overall. The markets may be undervaluing. Any other bets you see on the board you like for week four? Yeah, I'm going to ride with BYU. Listen, I know two overtime games in a row. This team has got to be gassed. But remember, these guys, some of these guys are 23 years old, married, are starting families. These guys are not 19-year-old kids. Right. I feel like not only are they better at decision-making, are they more responsible? Do they take better care of the football? However you want to look at it. BYU has kind of been this underlying sleeper team. Now, we're not getting as much value on them against Washington because of the result of beating Tennessee and beating USC. But this is a Washington team I wasn't sold on. I took the 13 and a half with Cal and kicked myself all the way to the bank that I didn't sprinkle any on the money line. I was so <laughs> mad at myself. So BYU is one of my favorite plays. And then I took the seven and a half last week with Florida State at Virginia because, again, overreaction to the line game lands on seven. I'm still not sold on Florida State. And now we're asking Florida State to go back to laying points Against a Louisville team that I think has some talent. Against a Louisville team that I am not necessarily high on. I'm more low on Florida State. And I've had other guys that do power rating numbers that had Florida State sky high all season long. And I understand, you know, all summer long going into the season. And now they're like, well, I'm just going to be done with this team because I had such a bad read. I'm not. I'm going to fade this team until at least laying points until it stops making me money. I think Louisville keeps this one close. And then I'm kind of teeter-tottering between either Oklahoma State um, over Texas. I, I cannot figure out Texas for the life of me. This is a Texas team that gets up big for Oklahoma games. And uh, Tom Herman as an underdog. Got to love it, right? Besides that, I, I'm not sold that this talented Texas team is ever going to get over that nine-win hump, is ever going to get uh, into the college football playoff. And Oklahoma State – has showed me on several occasions this year, they have the speed, they have the talent. Mike Gundy is gutsy. He makes the right calls, and he pushes that envelope. So Oklahoma State is on my radar. I'm not sure if they can win the game outright, but if it hits six, six and a half, I'm definitely going to bet it. And then I'm looking at Kentucky. We touched on Mississippi State. Mississippi State, you know, we heard uh, lots of SEC guys talk about, well, Mississippi State's just not as good as we thought they were going to be because K-State beat them. Well, I kind of agree with them. I don't think Mississippi State is a team that's going to be that great. The uh, Dan Mullen years are gone. Their quarterback, Fitzgerald, has gone. Their first-string quarterback, we still know, is kind of a question mark for this week. And uh, I just really think Kentucky had a shot to win last week, could have got it done, fell a little bit short. And don't be surprised if they get it done this week uh, in Starkville. All right. Excellent. I like that. Thank you very much, Kelly. I appreciate the insights. Fun conversation, too, and uh, always uh, going to lead to a good Saturday, I think. I want to let you go so you can get off to the countless other obligations that you have uh, lined up for the rest of the day. But thank you for taking time to talk to us. I really appreciate it, and hopefully we can get you on here again soon. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Covering the future. One big thank you goes out to Kelly Stewart uh, for joining us. Kelly Stewart, a Bleacher Reporter, for breaking down in Wager Talk TV and everywhere else for breaking down week four of college football. And Ed, she was talking about betting underdogs and the money line on them. And like, right. as a as a better, I feel like those are like, I'm not going for fun. You know, I want to make money, but it's really fun to root for underdogs uh, on the money line. So like, if you're just looking yep. for fun, I feel like that's kind of the way to go. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I don't know. I mean, I was pl I was plenty happy when when Iowa State just covered, you know. So, like, <laughs> many ways to find joy in life, I think. Um, but I think you know, in in the next couple of weeks, uh, that's, uh, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of value in that, uh, especially like in the last couple years. I've kind of done this overrated, um, kind of upset alert kind of thing yeah. on my site, and then you, it's you know, you pick a team in the top ten that's five, six, and zero. Oh, 
had a couple lucky wins earlier in the year and then just kind of bet some underdogs because they're probably, you know, they're probably overrated and the underdogs might win Mm -hmm. in in games that are close. I found it so valuable. I don't think I'm going to put it out on my public newsletter (laughs) this year, I think. Um, But but yeah, I do think there is a lot of value there. Um, I haven't gone back and necessarily quantified it yet, but um, for sure. I mean, over week five, five through eight, I mean, we're going to see some overrated teams where it's going to be great to get some money line action. We talk about overreactions in like a one se- a one week sample, but like they can, you know, teams can be due for aggression after five weeks, after eight weeks yeah. too. So um, I think that's something to keep out to keep a look out for. And Kelly was talking about that too with finding teams that the markets are always undervaluing. BYU with that week one loss, I mean Utah's a defensive line, they're going to cause some problems. So I think it made a lot of sense to buy into BYU and uh, getting a little love for Pat Fitzgerald. Always welcomed on covering the spread (laughs) as well. We'll dive into our covering the future in just one second, but Ed and I always preach searching for the best value when betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data in all one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's move down to covering the future. And One of the games we discussed with Kelly, Ed, was Notre Dame against Georgia. This game down in Georgia, and Georgia, 14-point favorite, total there 58.5, and And you want to talk about that one more here. So what do your numbers say about this game? Yeah, I mean, let's let's kind of think about it qualitatively for a sec. I have all the respect in the world for this Georgia program. I think they're definitively the third-best program in the nation behind Clemson and Alabama. And I'm even willing to cut them a little bit of a break for the fiasco against Texas in the bowl game. Yeah, maybe they didn't want to play. That's what all the Georgia fans tell me, at least. (laughs) So, you know, were they a little bit underrated in my preseason database model at fifth? Yeah, for sure. But but let's just look at the... um, But but I think a, a spread of Georgia by 14 is a big disrespect to Notre Dame. I think this is clearly a top 10 team... Um, they've done nothing in you know only two games to make us think otherwise. And we got to think that the numbers are probably underestimating Notre Dame a little bit. Remember, they started Brandon Wimbush the first three games. Uh, they got a win against uh, Michigan, uh, which was a very good win. Uh, he hit a couple deep balls in that game that really propelled them. But, you know, really struggled against two not so great opponents after that. And then Ian Book took over and has been very efficient throwing the ball. Like their passing numbers were excellent last year. Doesn't seem like that's let off at all this year. So I just think, you know, 14, this game is all about the number. I think Georgia is going to win. I think Notre Dame definitely makes it a game. And especially at 14, really like Notre Dame plus 14. Um, To kind of put that in perspective, you know, I – I was thinking, like, how, what's the biggest line I can make for Georgia? Mm-hmm. And we've talked in the preseason about how I took market win totals and um, backed out a rating for each team and so that we could figure out game spreads. So this is back in the preseason. And when you did that with that market model, that was the one that was most optimistic in this game. But even that would have made this a 12.5 point favorite for Georgia. So I just think 14 is too much. I think it's not giving enough respect for Notre Dame. You know, is it is it this whole idea that, you know, uh, Clemson cleaned their clock in the playoff last year and that's the last time we saw them play uh, a, a equal caliber team, um, you know, like Kelly was talking about? Is that playing in the minds of betters? Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that. Um, but but yeah, I, th- I think I think, you know, I, I, I don't think this line is going to be stay. It's going to be at 14 very long. I don't think it's just the Clemson game. I think it's like remnants of the Manti Teo like Alabama championship game. Well, yeah, like, yeah I was, think that those things are still lingering, but like Manti Teo is not at Notre Dame. Like this is, well, I, I know that like your numbers will take like a four year look. That game was a lot more than four years ago. So I think that, yeah. I think that we're going to see big numbers against Notre Dame against tough opponents because people have those lingering memories. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, that 2012 team shouldn't have even been in the national championship right. game. Like, they really struggled against the mediocre competition. Pretty lucky to go 12-0. Got their clocks cleaned by by Alabama. 
Um, you know, I mean, there's plenty of examples. I mean, obviously this was at Notre Dame, but they played Georgia very tough uh, a couple years ago in Jake Fromm's first game as a starter. And um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like, Jim, I thought about um, plugging Notre My numbers liked Notre Dame's playoff odds uh, yeah. based on FanDuel Sportsbook. And I went away from it basically because I saw this game, which yep. is still going to be a very tough game. Um, but they also go to Michigan and they go to Stanford. Well, I mean, they're going to be a big favorite at Stanford unless something drastic happens. Right. And Michigan, you know, as we've discussed, like hasn't looked great. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I think they're a lot better. Uh, I think it's mostly that army game. Um, so we'll see what happens against Wisconsin, but like all of a sudden that playoff picture changed. Like can, if they can somehow get a couple of key turnovers in this game and win right. it, Michigan and Stanford continue to slide. All of a sudden they're looking pretty pretty good right and the reason that I initially was drawn towards Georgia in this game is because I personally am a big Jake Fromm guy I love I love everything he does they don't let him do a whole lot uh, but when they do let him do goes nuts Uh, he has a 12.5 adjusted yards per attempt this year he was at 10.1 last year but Ian Book as you mentioned has carried over what happened last year and it's not just that Brandon Wimbush started at the beginning of the year. Ian Book got hurt in the middle of the year, too. Um, I think right. the Northwestern yep. game he got hurt um, and right. didn't play a whole lot. He hasn't thrown a ton this year because they've had just two games, but 14.3 adjusted yards per attempt. It's a pretty sick number, and he's athletic. He can run a bit, too. So um, I think that yep. Ian Book is a good enough quarterback to keep this game close. Yep. I personally don't want to touch the number because I don't have a good okay. enough feel on Notre Dame. But I understand why your numbers are into Notre Dame, and I think that it makes sense. So 14, Georgia minus 14. Uh, Ed has Notre Dame plus 14 for this one. Uh, I won't put you on the record for this, but because you know a lot about Michigan and it's a big game, <laughs> any feel for you one way or another on them against Wisconsin? Oh, I, I would definitely lean Michigan plus three and a half, especially okay. since it's over over the number. Um, you know, Kelly talked about the look-ahead line, and yeah. I, I looked it up. Uh, yeah, I had him at Michigan as a 4.7 point favorite yeah. uh, this preseason. So you're trying to tell me that based on two games, we're going to move this line eight points. Right. I mean, maybe if Wisconsin had played anybody, right. uh, maybe if Michigan actually would have lost the game, um, you know, do I have my concerns about Michigan? Sure. Yeah. I, I think there, there, there are definitely, and, and, you know, that's what I do for an hour. Every Thursday, I talk about right. <laughs> the, the, you know, the very, the intricacies of this Michigan team. Uh, which is an excellent exercise for me to kind of combine numbers right. with with watching film. Um, sure. So, yeah, you know, I mean, am I going to be shocked that Wisconsin, if Wisconsin covers? No. But, I, I mean, I like Michigan plus three and a half. Yeah, we always adjust perception of teams after we get data on them. But adjusting at eight points in two games is a, a big swift, a big swing for sure. For my cover in the future, I want to get a number because I think that it's probably not going to last very long. And it's a team that you have mentioned that you like, Ed. That's the Green Bay Packers. And initially, when I was diving into this, I wanted to talk about betting them to win the NFC because I have loved their defense so far. Their offense hasn't looked great, but they've also faced the Vikings and the Bears, and they're two really good defenses. And they got wins in both those games. But when I was looking at the numbers, they're plus 650 to win the NFC at FanDuel Sportsbook, which is tied with the Cowboys for third in the NFC behind the Rams and the Saints. And... The reason that I wanted to bet them to win the NFC was because I want no part of teams facing the Chiefs and the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Like, the AFC has the upper-tier teams in the NFL right now, so I wanted to stick with the NFC market. But I think that when you look at their number there and see that they're 17-1 to to win the Super Bowl and see they're plus 650 to win the NFC, it's kind of hard for me to justify betting them just to win the NFC. The Rams are 10 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. The Saints are 14 to 1, and then the Cowboys and the Eagles are both 15 to 1. Remember the Packers had the same NFC odds as the Cowboys, and their odds are actually shorter to win the NFC than the Eagles are. So, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for me to bet them to win the NFC. And I think that the their number to win the Super Bowl is actually more inefficient 
17 to 1 is a number that helps account for the strengths of the NFC, and it also gives me a discount on them relative to the Cowboys and the Eagles. So broadly, I want to buy the Packers. The specific numbers at FanDuel Sportsbook push me towards their Super Bowl odds at 17 to 1, but they're actually 10 to 1 at William Hill right now based on odds fire. So I think that if you want to get the Packers at this number based on the way their defense has looked, you're going to want to do it now. The odds of the regulated markets are longest at FanDuel Sportsbook right now at 17 to 1. Again, that's all via odds fire, but if you're some betting somewhere else and your numbers are good for the NFC, like if they are plus 800, cool, go there. I would totally be I would totally go there because that's my preferred market. But at FanDuel Sportsbook specifically, 17 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, not that bad. Uh, so I'm buying the Packers here, Ed. Uh, you've seen two games on them now. We yeah. liked what we saw in week one. We're very yep. happy with that. And then they beat the Vikings. Are you still in on them based on what you've seen so far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't see the game against Minnesota. I, I'm looking at the numbers, and, and it looks like you know Minnesota had more yards and, and yards for play in that game. Obviously, turnovers probably played a role in what went on. Um, but yeah, I'm still high on, on Green Bay for sure. Um, so... Did you mean to tell me that New Orleans has better Super Bowl odds right now than Green Bay? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you have, obviously, Bruce, Bruce is going to be out for a couple weeks now. Right. You have no idea what you're going to get from Bridgewater and Taysom Hill. Uh, I think I just saw that Sean Payton refuses to announce a starter for this week, which yep. is, is, is very interesting. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll probably be fine. I mean, I'm more looking to see what kind of regression we get on the defensive side of the ball. Right. Um and yeah, that, that doesn't make sense to me. So yeah, the Saints are actually fourth right now behind the Patriots, Chiefs, and Rams uh, for Still. the Super Bowl. Yeah, and this is, I'm looking at this literally right now, 322 I mean, on a Wednesday, um, and I mean, they're still there. But like the reason yep. that I am confused by that, which you are too, is we talked uh, with Whale Capper about the importance of a first round buy. Are you going to get a first round buy when you don't have Drew Brees for six weeks? Probably right. not. Uh, well, and, but the Packers but, are 2-0 and against two very respectable opponents. Like, they might get a first round bye. So, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the Packers probably still have a pretty tough division there. So, sure. let's not, you know, let's not give them the division just yet. But um, I think there's a lot of assumptions going in here, right? Like, Breeze messed up his thumb. He's yes. getting surgery on it. Yes. So, you're just going to assume that he's going to come back and be the Drew Brees of old? I think that's, uh, you know, I mean, you can hope. Or maybe the maybe the argument is ah he'll get some rest for six weeks, yeah. And the old man will actually be able to you know continue his play. In the play, I I, I don't know. I, I just don't. I think I part of it, it may be the Cam Newton injury potentially propping them up. Um, the Falcons, both their first round offensive linemen are already hurt. Um, wait, is Cam out for? No, he's not out yet. He didn't practice Wednesday, which stinks because okay. I want to play that game a lot for DFS on Sunday, and I right. want to shoot out. So I really would like Cam uh, to play, but it's making me nervous. But he might miss. Um, the Buccaneers had that awful Week One, so I, it may be right. a lack of confidence in the NFC South, which looked good before the year. But like, I can't justify. I can't come close to justifying New Orleans at fourteen to one. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. All right. Uh, that is all we have for today. So, Ed, before we wrap up for today, we're going to come back tomorrow and preview the NFL Week 3 with Brett Colson. Anything you want to plug over at the Football Analytics Show over at or over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I mean, at the Power Rank, uh, you can get a sample of my best predictions that I usually say for paying members of the site. Uh, email goes out with those predictions and my analysis uh, Thursday at noon Eastern. So uh, it's a good way to kind of see what my numbers are saying. And, and, and uh, you know, just I try to put a little context in there. So I'm just not leaving you hanging out to dry with a number. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people uh, enjoy getting that little taste. Yep. And, um, yeah, so check it out, thepowerrank.com. Yep, and you can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to Covering the Spread 
on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Store, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find Covering the Spread. And while you are there, leave a rating and review as well. Big thank you goes out to Kelly Stewart for swinging on by, breaking down week four of college football and her favorite bets on the board. Big thank you to Kelly there. Again, find her on Twitter at Kelly in Vegas. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for keeping us on the air here on the video side of things and chopping things up for the at FanDuel Twitter account. And thank you to those of you who tuned in for today. Back at you tomorrow to talk some NFL. We'll get you then. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.